Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Tracy Cook and I'm with SACS Healthcare Communications. Welcome to our webinar. For today, I'd like to show our audience how to send in your questions, which our speakers will answer as many as possible at the end of the webinar. Please type your questions into the questions box. Our moderator for today is Christina Davis. Christina is currently an adjunct professor at University of United States in San Diego, California, and Aspen University in Denver, Colorado. Christina has an extensive background in GI digestive disorders in both the treatment and diagnosis of GI and hepatitis disorders. Her background includes clinical research through the NIH and FDA on infection-related topics. Christina, welcome. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you, Tracy, for that very kind introduction. The title of today's webinar is Advancing Anal Rectomanometry, Incorporating the London Protocol. Speaking today on this very important topic is Allison Becker. Allison is a registered nurse from Cleveland, Ohio, who graduated from Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio in 2013 with her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing. She started her career at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation on a med surge floor focused on post-operative patients after colorectal surgery. She is currently working at the NYU Center for Esophageal Health as the Director of Motility Nursing, where she actively performs esophageal motility testing and provides direct patient care. She is currently completing her Master's of Science in Nursing at NYU Roy Meyer School of Nursing with a focus in nursing education. The speaker has disclosed the following financial relationships, uh, Speakers Bureau for Medtronic, and the opinions expressed are the personal opinions of the speaker and do not reflect the opinions or views of the sponsor Medtronic or Sachs Healthcare Communications. And this activity has been approved for one contact hour for nurses. A link to obtain your certificate will be available at the end of the webinar. The accreditation statement is below uh, and support for this activity has been provided by Medtronic. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Allison. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we'll be discussing anorectal manometry and nursing care uh, and how the new London Protocol guidelines are going to be applicable to our daily practice. Okay, so here we just have a few learning objectives for the session today. Uh, we'll be talking about the anatomy of the anorectum, uh, the use of motility testing for the anorectum, and how the London Protocol is applicable. Okay, just a fair warning. Uh, today we're going to be discussing all things efficacy, so anus, sphincter, rectum, stool, all of the above. If you registered for the talk today, you probably knew this was coming, uh, but as nurses, I hope we can uh, all find some mature humor in our discussion. Uh, and just be aware that I'm not above a good poop joke. I've been a GI nurse for the better part of 10 years, uh, so it's become pretty routine in my daily care. Okay, um, so before we talk about testing, I wanna make sure we understand uh, the anatomy and physiology of the anorectum. Okay, um, so our rectum is the final part of the colon or the large intestine. It's about 20 centimeters of smooth muscle, and it serves as a collection of any indigestible food stuff and forms our stool until it's evacuated. So the anal canal, um, it comes after the rectum, and it measures about three to six centimeters in length. Um, it contains an endoderm lining. So this is a nerve um, abundant um, you know, form of tissue that helps to signal to the brain to do things and does things like recognize the consistency of stool, how full the bowel is, et cetera. Um, it also is very key in telling us when our bowels need to be emptied. So then at the end of the anus, um, we have the external and internal sphincter, um, which I'll go into a, in a lot more detail on the next slide, but I'll likely be referring to them from here on out as the IAS and the EAS. Okay, um, so our deeper look into um, the anal sphincters. So we have the inner and outer or internal and external um, anal sphincters at the end of the anal canal. 
The inner sphincter is ring-like in shape, and it's managed by the enteric nervous system. So this is not something that's under our voluntary control. Uh, it's composed of smooth muscle, um, and is primarily responsible for general resting tone of the anal sphincter. Um, it's about 80% of that. It's thought to be responsible um, for making sure that during times of relaxation, like when we're sleeping or, or when we're just, you know, um, hanging out, that um, it's in charge of making sure our rectum doesn't open inappropriately. Um, no one will want that. So when we go to defecate, the IAS relaxes and the external anal sphincter or the EAS then contracts. EAS supports the inner sphincter, so it helps it to perform its function. However, unlike the inner sphincter, the outer sphincter can be controlled voluntarily. It's made of striated and smooth muscle combined. Um, so this is why we can control and when we want to go and empty our bowels and when we want to hold the stool back. So um, it also can act involuntarily despite our having some control over it. Um, the sphincter overlaps the IAS and creates this kind of high pressure zone, uh, this high pressure zone. Uh, it lies about two centimeters above the anal verge. Um, so these muscles work together either when we squeeze to hold in or to evacuate stool. Um, the EAS helps to manage that voluntary squeeze pressure. Um, the other pelvic floor muscles um, that are in our pelvic floor are heavily involved in that as well. Um, those muscles are innervated through the pudendal nerve. Um, so sometimes uh, any kind of you know nerve function damage or loss uh, can result in the patient experiencing fecal incontinence due to that um, exact reasoning. So um, just finishing up on this anatomy slide, uh, the hemorrhoids are also involved. Um, they are the cushions of tissue that are filled with blood vessels found uh, at the end of the rectum just inside the anus. Um, so these work together with the anal sphincter to help to close off the bowel, again, preventing stool from leaving our body when we do not want it to. Um, uh, oftentimes, you know, patients will tell you that they have hemorrhoids. Everybody has hemorrhoids. Um, but when patients say they have hemorrhoids, usually they're referencing that they have enlarged or inflamed hemorrhoids. Um, and, you know, I'm sure everyone's familiar with uh, what that can feel and look like. Um, they can also sometimes refer to them as piles. Um, so our pelvic floor, which I had briefly mentioned, um, it's made up of muscles, ligaments, connective tissue, uh, and it's supposed to help to support our pelvic organs and close off the lower part of the pelvic cavity. Um, openings in the strong sheet of muscular tissue um, are where our rectum and our urethra uh, and um, vagina are for a patient with a female anatomy. Uh, the pelvic floor relaxes when you're supposed to have a bowel movement and contractions and contracts and squeezes when you want to hold stool back. Okay, so when we're going to defecate, what's exactly happening? Now that we know the structures that are involved in this act, uh, we'll talk about how it occurs. So the IAS, the internal anal sphincter, is a, is a continuation of the musculature of the colon, and it's not under our voluntary control, as we discussed. The EAS is skeletal muscle, innervated by the pudendal nerve, and is under our voluntary control for the most part. We also have the puborectalis muscle. Um, it's another... Um, skeletal muscle, um, striated muscle um, that's under our voluntary control. This kind of forms a sling from the pubic synthesis and around the rectum. Usually it's contracted and maintains that anorectal angle. Again, just helping to make sure that we have control over our bowels um, and are not um, being, becoming incontinent. So when a movement of stool moves into the rectum, the rectum descends. This leads to the relaxation of the internal anal sphincter and the contraction of the external anal sphincter. And this is what stimulates our urge to defecate. So here we have to make a choice, to go or not to go. Um, if our timing is appropriate, um, then what happens, I'm sorry, first I'm going to go over when the timing is inappropriate, such as in the middle of our lecture today, um, your mind is going to trigger your body to continually contract the EAS, um, the puborectalis, 
and kind of reverse the relaxation of the IAS, the internal anal, anal sphincter, um, and reverse peristalsis at first. So it moves that stool back into the more proximal colon. However, if we've got our nice, relaxed, you know, we've got our, we're at home base, we've got our porcelain thrown, everything's quiet and ready to go. Um, when our brain decides to tell our body that the timing is right, um, the relaxation of the external anal sphincter occurs. The puborectalis muscle, instead of being um, bent, will straighten, um, straight, which then straightens the rectum. The rectal contraction occurs, and that propels the stool forward to be evacuated. Defecation is triggered by what is known as the gastrocolic reflex. Um, so essentially what this is, is feces and gas in the colon are transported to the rectum by um, peristaltic mass contractions. And then the rectum at the end of the colon then functions as that reservoir. When it becomes spilled, um, those, uh, that reflex and the sensory fibers in the rectum sense that, and your body becomes consciously aware of the need to update. So the longer you wait to go, the more intense that urge point. Uh, the last um, uh, reflex I'll discuss is the rare, which we'll go into a lot more in a lot more detail later on. Um, but the rare is very important when it comes to uh, the stool movement further down into the anal cavity. Okay. All right, so we learned probably way too much detail, honestly, about the assessment of anorectal function. Uh, um, so now we talk about the assessment of anorectal function once we, now that we discuss the anatomy. Okay, so um, first and foremost, the tied and true digital rectal exam. Um, so this image is actually detecting the assessment of the prostate and the male anatomy. Uh, so it's likely a urology teaching tool, but uh, we can still see all the structures and the good image, uh, despite the fact that it's probably not for GI. Um, it's a very common tool. Um, it can assess for cuba rectalis lift, IAS and EAS relaxation, perineal descent, and the contraction of our abdominal muscles during uh, uh, bear down. Um, usually to perform this, we lay the patient on their left lateral side, um, and then we insert the finger um, just at rest. We're assessing the resting tone of our anal sphincters, followed by requesting the patient to squeeze on our finger for as long as they can. That assesses the strength. Um, and we also uh, can feel on the abdomen to assess those um, abdominal muscles and tell the patients to bear down like they're trying to push our finger out. Um, it's a useful tool, um, you know, in more ways than just assessing tone. Um, you can feel for any kinds of mass, um, and you check for any evidence of bleeding, um, as well as uh, it's important to perform before inserting a um, anorectal manometry catheter. We want to make sure that um, it's safe to place this catheter. And usually, we check with that uh, with the digital rectal exam. If it's ever painful or the patient's you know very uncomfortable, then you know, maybe this isn't the correct test for them. It should not be painful. Okay. Uh, another method of testing anorectal function uh, is the MR defecography. So this is an MRI. Um, it uses um, magnetic resonance to obtain images at various stages of defecation. So we're seeing a lot of different things. Uh, we're seeing how well the muscles in the pelvis floor are functioning providing insight into rectal function. Um, we can use it to help determine a cause of fecal incontinence or constipation, uh, identifying rectal prolapse. Um, all sorts of uh, information can be learned with this imaging. So uh, what we can tell our patients to expect during uh, this imaging, it's a little bizarre, but you know, everything kind of is when we're talking about um, anorectal function. Um, Essentially, what the radiology team does is they insert a substance, like a gel, um, it's similar to the consistency of feces uh, with contrast in it. Um, they'll put it into the rectum, and the female patients sometimes they'll insert it into the vagina as well, just to see how um, if there's any prolapse, vaginal prolapse. Um, they then place a the towel under the patient um, to just, you know, get any leakage that may come out. And then they um, can, depending on the facility, they can either have the patient sitting on a commode with, imaging, with uh, the imaging kind of around them to take the photos, 
Uh, sometimes they'll have them uh, on like a movable exam table lying on their back with their knees bent, you know, with holsters. Um, it, it, it just depends on what the, your institution uses. Um, so then while um, they are in that position, they're asked to basically defecate, you know, squeeze, strain, um, push things out, try to hold um, the liquid in as well. Um, you know, it's always nice to just give them a heads up, hey, this is going to be a little awkward, especially because they're basically asking you to poop in front of them. Uh, but it's going to be really important to help us identify why you're having these problems. Okay, so now we're going to be discussing anorectal manometry, uh, which is what we're all here to learn about today. Um, so we learn all about anal sphincter function, rectal sensation, and rectal compliance and anorectal reflexes during this test. Um, so any of the listed here indications here would indicate that potentially some kind of dysfunction in those areas uh, is going on. Uh, so you know this isn't a you know initial test for a lot of patients. They've usually been experiencing these symptoms for quite some time. Uh, and we need to do some further investigation, and this is a really good option. Okay. Um, so what we do during anorectal manometry is we insert a catheter into the anus and through to the rectum um, to assess the entire anal canal and the rectal ball. Um, so these catheters have pressure sensors up and down it um, that are used to assess the contractile force in the anorectum as well as how the muscles respond to various maneuvers that the staff asks the patient to perform. Um, so I have here a couple of different images of um, anorectal manometry, um, you know, procedure. So the way that it was originally interpreted was through line tracing. So you can see an A and B over here. Um, and A, this is an exhibiting a patient bearing down, uh, like they're trying to have a bounce. Uh, so we can see there's an increase in rectal pressures and decrease in anal pressures. And then in B, um, this is um, the patient trying to squeeze and hold stool in. So you can see these positive deflections, and those are indica in indicating that the catheter is feeling pressure. Now, these line tracings can be a little difficult to digest. So um, with recent technology, uh, we've transitioned to using color topography charts, which is the other image on the screen. Um, these are um, the same images. So A correlates to the A color topography correlates to the A line chart. The B color topography correlates to the B chart. Um, so again, this is the patient squeezing and bearing down, rectal pressure being sensed here. And then this is the patient um, squeezing, trying to hold stool in, and you can see that's indicated there. Um, I'll go into a little bit, uh, I'll go into what the colors mean in a later slide, um, but uh, it's just a lot more digestible way to interpret the information and make it more, a little more user-friendly. Okay, so um, as nurses and techs, you know, we're going to be very heavily involved in um, the setup and care of these catheters um, and the procedures. Um, so setup requires just a simple input of patient data into whatever software or program um, that's run for the motility study. Um, and then we would also need to calibrate our probe. So to calibrate, the probe goes into a zero pressure chamber and is plugged into the motility modules that are um, attached. Uh, I'll, I'll show you guys some images on the screen in a little bit and what our setup in our clinic looks like. So once the catheter is inserted into that chamber, it fills with air to test the sensor's efficiency. Um, so in high resolution manometry with the color topography, uh, basically we want to see a solid block of color up here on the screen. That color usually goes from cool colors to warm colors, so dark blue to green to yellow to red and then a bright magenta color. Um, so that's indicating pressure um, being applied on the catheter with the air that's being put, um, placed into the chamber. And then the air pressure pulls back and you see those colors go from warm to cool. So basically that magenta color back to blue. Um, I've got a few different brands of anorectal manometry catheters. Um, 
so essentially these catheters have a number of uh, channels and sensors on them. They're usually around four to five millimeters in diameter, so they're very thin. Um, and you can also see there is a balloon uh, at the tip of the catheter here, and then um, a just a balloon by itself at this bottom image. Um, the balloon is going to be deflated uh, while it's being inserted into the patient, but then we inflate the balloon um, uh, as part of the test to detect rectal sensitivity. Um, so there are these, these sensors that are over here are testing the anal sphincter strength, and these sensors here are inside of that balloon, and that's um, testing the rectal pressure. Um, so let's say your catheter didn't calibrate. Um, the software will tell you if there's something wrong, and usually you can see if it did not calibrate properly. There are like little pinches um, at, instead of like a solid block of color. Um, just you know, you'll you'll be it's very easy to tell when it doesn't go right. Um, there's a number of different methods you can try. Um, there's a feature called tuning the system. You can block certain corrupted sensor channels, but um, your tech support for whatever company you're using is going to really be able to help guide you through that. Um, but it's very important to take good care of the catheters. The um, sensors are very sensitive, um, so avoiding touching them as much as possible. Um, and in the Medtronic equipment, which is what we use in our office, uh, we want when we're applying this balloon and tying it on, we really want to uh, be delicate and um, not use press those on those sensors if at all possible. So you can see there's these little silver markings here. Those are those are not sensors. You can touch those, but that's usually what we try to only press on when we're um, tying that balloon onto the catheter. Uh, another way we want to take care of these is um, we recommend doing a weekly bath for the catheter. Um, essentially, it's called in vivo calibration. Uh, the goal is, is for the sensors to be able to adapt to and recognize the temperature of the human body. So uh, you basically just let the catheters sit in um, temper body temp equivalent water. It's about 96.8 to 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, for one minute um, every five to seven days um, so that they, those sensors can continue to recognize that. It's a little spot A for them. Okay. Uh, so here I have a photo of the routine set up in our office. Um, they can see uh, it requires a number of supplies uh, to be ready at the bedside. Uh, we've got lube, plenty of gloves, office gloves, oftentimes we double gloves. Um, you can just change the outermost gloves in case they get soiled. Uh, we've got tape um, to secure the catheter, uh, tissues um, and wipes so the patient can clean themselves up, um, along with the calibrated catheter itself. Uh, and you can see this is the Medtronic equipment, as I said before. Um, so we've got the catheter, and then it's got a little um, you know, pigtail um, tubing off the side of it. You attach a um, three-way stopcock and a 60cc syringe to that um, pigtail. Uh, and this is what we use to inflate the balloon that's at the tip of the catheter during the rectal sensitivity testing, which I'll go into in a lot more detail later. Um, you also see uh, we've got a, these moon pants. They're always the hit. Um, uh, just, you know, a little way to lighten the mood, uh, make people a little less nervous. Um, they basically just, they're basically just really, you know, cheap shorts that have a flap on the butt. Uh, they're used for a lot of colonoscopies, so we have the patients put them on, and then we open the flap and insert the catheter. Um, and you can see there's also a commode um, and a little cuff uh, and a balloon on the tip of this catheter with another um, pigtail tubing and the timer. This is the setup for the balloon expulsion test. I'll go over this more again a bit later, uh, but essentially we have, we insert that balloon filled with about 50 mLs of water into the patient's rectum, and we have them sit on that commode and see how long it takes for them to expel it. Okay, so this is a very sensitive um, area that we're dealing with here. Um, so we always want to make sure we're providing really, you know, patient and empathetic care uh, whenever we're ha having patients come in for this procedure. 
Uh, we like to establish rapport in our office right off the bat uh, when they are either directly referred to us or um, if one of our physicians saw them in clinic, we still give them a call and just say, hi, you know, my name's Allie. I'm the nurse that's going to be doing the anorectal rectalmanometry test with you. I just wanted to introduce myself and explain the test a little bit more to you, answer any questions that you may have about it, um, just so, you know, we can, you know, get through this with as few hiccups as possible. Um, so, um, our, if we do, are dealing with a direct referral, you know, we always have our team uh, review the rec patient records to ensure that it's an appropriate test. Uh, there's no contraindications to it. Um, we then call the patient and explain the test, um, providing a lot of reassurance, like I said. Um, so, as far as preparation goes uh, for this test, um, there is none required, uh, but uh, sometimes it's recommended to have a sleep enema uh, before the before the test. We always tell our patients if you don't feel comfortable giving yourself a sleep enema, that's okay. You don't need to do it. We usually just encourage them to try to have a bowel movement before coming in because if there's formed stool in the rectum, then um, that can impede the catheter. We would just have to make them go anyways. Um, but the enema is not required. Uh, some patients want to do it because they're self-conscious and they don't want us to see, you know, stool coming out during the test. But, you know, we just try to reassure them, you know, we've seen everything at this point, so nothing's going to save us. Okay. Um, so on the day of the appointment, they come in, they either took the sleep enema at home or they didn't. We bring them into the room and explain the test yet again. We let them actually look at the catheter and see um, you know, what is going to be going into their body. Um, if a patient has a history of, you know, trauma or sexual abuse and they disclose that they don't feel comfortable doing the test, obviously we're never going to force them to do that. Um, sometimes if the patient's um, really not responding well to the catheter, we just, you know, decide not to do the test. Um, we never want to cause any more harm than good what we're doing in this procedure. Um, so we explained to them, you know, this is never going to be painful. It should not be a painful test. If it's ever painful, please tell us and we will stop. Um, so we tell, explain how we're going to place the catheter, which has sensors all up and down it, and just deflated balloon at the tip into the rectum. And when the catheter is in, it will ask you to do things like squeezing and pushing. Then we inflate the balloon to assess the sensitivity in your rectum. Uh, the catheter will only really be in for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we remove it. Um, so then explain to them again, you know, we're doing this today to look at the muscle strings and the coordination down below so we can get more info about your symptoms. Uh, so once, you know, everyone's in agreement and we're going to proceed with testing, we have the patient uh, put on the moon pan and lay on their left side um, on our um, exam bed. Um, so, you know, we, are, we just try to talk them through everything You know, say, okay, you're going to feel my hands um, as I spread your cheeks. The first thing I'm going to do is just take a look. Um, you'll feel my hands at the backside. Um, then we do a quick digital rectal exam to make sure the catheter stays in place. Um, so you'll feel my finger and some full pressure. Uh, and then I tell them, you know, okay, everything looks good. We're going to proceed with the test. Uh, now we'll insert the catheter. It's even smaller than my finger. Uh, so we insert the catheter and then press start on the uh, software, on the motility software. Um, apply tape on the catheter so it doesn't move. Uh, and then we begin the test. So um, there's a very clear, you know, step um, by step progression of what we're going to be doing in the interrectal test. So it makes it very clear for the staff involved as to what they need to be doing as well as explaining to the patient, okay, next we're gonna do this. So this never changes. We're always going in the step-by-step -step manner. Um, so I'll go through you know, what all of these maneuvers mean in a little bit, and then we'll discuss the order of them uh, later on in our discussion when we're talking about the London Protocol and its recommendation. Okay, so first we're obtaining a resting pressure. Um, now, uh, you can see here, uh, this is the correlated anatomy where the catheter is in the body, and this is what that would look like in um, the screen of the um, motility software during the procedure. Uh, so I mentioned before, uh, you know, our color topography 
So the warm colors are high pressure. So you can see up here that purple, that means the catheter is feeling something squeezing down on it. Cool colors are low pressure, meaning that the catheter is uh, not being touched by anything. Uh, so this uh, image right here makes sense. So this would be um, the anal sphincters, which are supposed to be contracted at rest. And this is the rectal bulge up here. Um, this is supposed to not um, be contracting at all at rest. Um, down at the bottom, uh, the X axis, as the um, images you move across the screen, it just um, blocks it off into uh, uh, 10 second increments. So it's just the time elapsed during the study. Um, so, you know, when we're uh, getting the resting pressure, we just tell our patients, okay, we're just going to let the catheter get used to your body. Uh, we're going to do that for about three minutes. Um, so then during that three minute period, when we're getting that resting pressure period, um, we kind of just talk them through the test, talk them through the stepwise progression, um, just so they have a little bit of an understanding of what's going on and it just fills up that dead space and uh, makes that three minutes go by a little faster. Okay, so uh, then we have the patients um, get a squeeze pressure. Um, so squeezing meaning that we want them to try to hold stool in, like squeezing like they don't want to have a bowel movement. Um, so this is helping us to assess the strength of the external anal sphincter during voluntary squeezing. Um, so what we do is we tell them, okay, um, the first thing we're going to do today when I say go is squeeze like you're trying not to have a bowel movement. We're trying to hold stool in. We're going to do this three times, about five seconds of a squeeze at about five seconds of a squeeze each for those three times. Then I'll have you squeeze for a fourth time and we're gonna try to hold as much as we can for 30 seconds. Okay, then next we have uh, the push maneuvers. Um, so this is when we're asking patients to bear down and act like they're defecating. Um, so this is where we're going to be looking at um, the pressure changes in both the rectum and the anal sphincters um, during attempted defecation. Um, so we ask them to push, just like they're trying to have a bowel movement and push the catheter out. So normal verbiage that we would use during the test would say, okay, now next we're going to ask you to push like you're trying to have a bowel movement at home. Um, I know this isn't exactly normal circumstances, but you know, just pretend like you're uh, in your you know, favorite place to go. Uh, so you're gonna do this twice, about 15 seconds each, and we'll tell them when to start to stop. Okay, so um, another uh, two additions to the um, stepwise progression uh, are rectal sensory testing and cough. So um, I'll just discuss cough first. It's very simple, it's just assessing when what happens when a patient coughs. We want to see the integrity of the uh, reflex arc, uh, that puborectalis muscle, um, that is responsible for maintaining continence, even during an abrupt, unplanned increase of intra-abdominal pressure. So if we cough or sneeze, um, you know, we want to make sure that those muscles are responding appropriately um, and, you know, we see a squeeze that is just supposed to happen. Um, so all we say is, okay, I'm going to have you cough deeply one time from your chest uh, to look for an automatic response. And then you can see on the imaging here um, as they cough, the uh, pressure increases, which is what's supposed to occur. Um, so we usually have them do that twice. And then um, rectal sensory testing. So this is probably the most um, involved part of the test, and it's usually, you know, can be sometimes confusing for patients. But um, a tool that we use is we give them a sheet that's labeled one, two, three, four, and five. And basically, as we're inflating air into the balloon, we want them to tell us five things. We want them to tell us when they first feel something different. It doesn't have to be a sustained difference. We just want them to tell us when they feel, you know, a little blip of something. It could be you feel like gas or a little bit of bloating, but it doesn't have to, you know, persist. Um, so number two would be when you persistently feel that, you know, a little blip of a sensation, um, more than 10 seconds. Number three is when we would tell, 
is when they would tell us that they have a desire to defecate. So basically this is you're out shopping, got your shopping cart, and you feel the urge, you feel like, okay, this is going to happen soon, but you're not rushing, you're saying, okay, I can definitely, you know, wait till we get home, I don't want to go in the gross grocery store bathroom. Uh, number four is when you're experiencing urgency. So this is when you're like, okay, I'm not going to make it home. I'm going to have to leave. I'm going to have to leave my shopping cart and get and find the closest bathroom. Uh, this is, you know, getting to be an urgent situation. And then finally, number five is um, something that you would never kind of let happen. It's the most you can possibly tolerate. Uh, but it feels like you could have an accident at any moment. Uh, it shouldn't be painful, um, you know, of course, when once they feel, um, uh, you know, high sensation, then we will stop. But um, that's, uh, so those are what we're telling the patients to identify. So as we are, so we're having them tell us that as we are inflating air into the balloon. We usually inflate about 10 cc's of air in at a time. Uh, and then at, when they tell us that they're having, you know, the different numbers, one, two, three, four, and five, we mark on the software when they feel those numbers. So we can go back to that point as a reference um, and say, okay, they uh, felt their initial sensation at 30 cc's of air in the rectum. Okay. Um, I had mentioned the rare, um, the reflux before. Um, so this is supposed to automatically occur when the rectum descends. Um, and the, what we're looking for is the IAS, the internal anal sphincter, um, automatically relaxing uh, when uh, there is something sensed in the rectum. Um, so what we do is we just inflate about 50 mLs of air into the balloon uh, during the catheter, um, while the catheter is placed, we usually do this right before we begin the rectal sensory testing. Um, so we're just noticing whether or not the sphincter relaxes here, it relaxes beautifully. You're basically just assessing if that is present or absent. Um, if it's absent, sometimes that usually means the patient has a history of Hirsch Sprung's disease, um, or they have some kind of like visceral neuropathies going on um, where that uh, automated reflux is. Okay, um, and then finally the balloon expulsion test. So you saw our setup earlier with that little commode. It's very simple. Um, we're just inflating the, um, the, a different balloon, not the same balloon that's on the manometry catheter with 50 ml, inserting that into the body. Uh, and then the patient sits on the toilet and we see how long it takes. Then we have them set a timer um, anything greater than 60 seconds is considered abnormal, but we have them attempt for five minutes. Um, so this is done usually after the um, entire stepwise progression of the anorectal manometry catheter. This is done after the uh, catheter is removed from the patient's body. Okay, so um, now that we understand how we're testing, um, what are we looking for during these tests? So these are the main diagnoses that we learn about uh, when performing high-res anorectal manometry. Um, so dysnergic defecation is usually our most common um, symptom, uh, common diagnosis when it comes to uh, doing this test on constipated patients. So this is what occurs because of insufficient relaxation or paradoxical contraction of the external anal sphincter and or the puborectalis muscle during defecation. Um, so usually uh, patients with dysmergia um, feel like when they go, they don't fully go. Um, they often feel like they're very bloated or distended. Uh, and they always feel like they have to poop, but when they go to try, nothing comes out. Um, but paradoxical contraction is when um, the anal finger is contracting when it's supposed to be relaxing. Um, and that, you know, increase, leads to um, obstructive defecation and constipation. Uh, and then, of course, fecal incontinence is um, when the involuntary or inability um, to control um, 
fecal discharge uh, through the anus comes out. So that we, we would usually see um, the um, diminished rectal capacity, um, weak cuborectalis muscle, low resting pressure of the anal sphincter. Um, so here I have just the different patterns of dyspnergia. Um, so this is supposed to be when the patient is pushing. Um, so you can see up here is our normal. Uh, we've got contraction of the rectum and relaxation of the finger, which is supposed, what's supposed to happen. Um, in type 1 dyspnergia, we can see that the patient's generating an adequate push force um, but, uh, in the rectum, but their anal finger is, for whatever reason, contracting instead of relaxing. In type 2, um, the rectum is not pushing as it's supposed to, um, and the anal sphincters are just not relaxing enough. In type 3, we see um, adequate rectal um, pushing force, but um, inadequate or um, absent sphincter relaxation. And in type 4, uh, we see that there's just really nothing kind of going on here. Um, the rectum isn't pushing and the sphincter just isn't responding to uh, the patient at all. So this is um, just examples of what we learned, especially in our constipated patients. Okay, so treatment for uh, motility disorders. When it comes to uh, dysnergic defecation and um, paradoxical defecation, uh, pelvic floor PT and biofeedback are uh, certainly fantastic options. Because um, we've identified it's an outlet problem, it's not necessarily a colon contractility problem with these diagnoses. So laxatives may not exactly help these patients. Um, they may even cause diarrhea because it's not a problem that the colon's not moving, it's that there's a blockage and a disconnect at what these muscles are supposed to be doing at the end. Um, so, you know, first thing is we tell our patients and educate them that even though your things you're telling your brain to do, um, you know, what you've been doing since birth, which is essentially, you know, pushing out a bowel movement, um, you're unconsciously squeezing instead of pushing. Um, so, uh, in biofeedback, what they use is simulated defecation training. Um, they sometimes insert a balloon. Um, into the rectum to teach and then teach the patient to tighten their abdominal muscles and push stool out. Um, it's also involving, you know, training to relax and contract the pelvic floor. Um, sometimes they'll put, you know, interactal manometry catheters in and have the patient watch on the screen like, okay, you see when these colors go up, this means you're contracting instead of relaxing. So try to correct, they're just trying to consciously correct this um, incorrectly learned behavior um, that they have somehow gotten. So um, it's essentially practicing pooping. Um, the PT pulls on the balloon gently and reminds the patient to relax their pelvic floor, um, tense their abdominal muscles, concentrate on the balloon. When it comes to um, treating fecal incontinence or loose finger pressures, um, you can also use pelvic floor PT and biofeedback uh, to strengthen those muscles. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, we offer medical management like antidiarrheal or bulking agents like fiber. Uh, sometimes they'll need a surgical intervention um, to address, you know, an anatomical problem, particularly rectal prolapse. Okay. So we have learned all about anorectal manometry today. So now we're going to talk about um, the new additions to this um, procedure um, that were discussed in a group of experts um, when they met, and they called it the London Protocol. So uh, what the London Protocol is aiming to doing is it's aiming to decrease the varied practices of anorectal testing between different centers. Um, so the goal of the authors uh, was to just standardize anorectal function testing based on objective and physiological measurements. So a single study can have an outcome with more than one of these components, but these are essentially what we're aiming to isolate based on the um, anorectal manometry, balloon expulsion testing, and the rectal sensitivity testing. 
So um, what they recommended, um, they came to a consensus on the above issues. They agreed that there should, that testing should be performed on referral after any concerning pathology has been excluded, like cancer or any inflammatory processes. Uh, testing can be used to evaluate symptoms of constipation and evacuation disorders, fecal incontinence, anorectal pain, pre-op assessment prior to fistulotomy or sphincterectomy or rectopexy, as well as to assess the anorectal functions in patients after um, a traumatic obstetric or OB injury during childbirth. Uh, they also agreed that bowel prep is optional. We talked about the flea cinema before, um, but it should be documented if they do use a flea cinema because uh, sometimes that can change um, the way uh, the rectum responds. Um, but all other meds should be continued as normal. Um, and uh, if they do have or take, are taking medications that can erect, uh, impact anorectal function, such as uh, narcotics, uh, then uh, that should be documented as well. They also agreed that digital rectal exam should be performed prior to intubation uh, to assess the pelvic floor and exclude any local pathologies, again, to make sure a catheter placement is safe. Um, so I'll go into the protocol uh, recommendations in the next couple of slides. Um, as far as measurements go, when it comes to the description of what's normal, essentially what they're the London Protocol authors are getting that is that because there are many manufacturers on different equipments and different catheters and different software programs to um, perform an anorectal manometry test, it's really hard to set a fair and normal value across all of the different brands. So what they agreed that is if the normal values are based on published data, then equipment set of a procedure should be identical to that. Um, and it should be identical to the agreed steps and order of the testing maneuvers, which I'll again go over in another slide. Okay, so here we have um, what the London Protocol recommends uh, your stepwise progression should be. Uh, so we want a three minute resting pressure stabilization after insertion, um, and then another 60 seconds of a resting pressure. Uh, then we do our squeezes times three. We want um, three squeezes of uh, duration of five seconds and then a uh, with a recovery interval of 30 seconds. And then we want our long squeeze, uh, just the one. So we want them to squeeze for 30 seconds and then let them recover for another 60 seconds after that. After we squeeze, we advise the patient to do a cough. Uh, they recommend two coughs, uh, again, to test for that automatic reflex. Um, and then we recommend the pushes. So we do three pushes, trying to push for 15 seconds each, recovering for 30 seconds in between each push. After that, um, you will then go into the rectal sens sensory testing where you're inflating the balloon and telling the patient to uh, report when they um, feel the um, air in the balloon. So you'll to explain to them again those five different uh, sensations they're going to report. One is when you sense something. Two is when you consistently feel something. Three is when you first have the urge to defecate, but it can wait. Four is when it's getting more urgent. And five is the possible highest that you can tolerate. Um, so you increase, the as the performer of the test, like I said before, you increase um, the air by 10 um, cc's each time. Uh, using the three-way stop to make sure that air is staying in the balloon and not coming back out. Um, and then you usually wait 30 seconds between each um, between each inflation. Uh, the maximum air you're going to put in these balloons is about 320 ml. Um, so after we do uh, the uh, sensory testing, then you do the rare. Um, so that is... Um, just when you're putting the 50 cc's of air into the balloon and assessing for that reflux, whether or not it's present. Uh, and then after um, all of this, we do, we do our balloon expulsion test. So the authors wanted to make a simple way of diagnosing um, the, um, the different kind of things that you learn about uh, when you're doing this test. So they um, made these really nice flow charts um, so basically, they're just telling you, like, okay, if you notice this reading, uh, then this is usually what that means. And it kind of uh, flows 
behind that um, as far as, you know, if you find this reading and then you find this reading, then this is what happens. So uh, what, what I mean by that is uh, the first uh, figure disorder uh, is to detect for rare. If rare is not detected, then it's a disorder of rectoanal areflexia. Um, next, the second, um, anal tone and contractility, um, that if we're noting reduced or increased anal resting pressure, um, then that qualifies for anal hypo or hypertension. Anal hypocontractility describes reduced anal squeeze pressure, and this combined with anal hypotension can describe um, a coexistent reduction in both anal resting pressure and anal squeeze pressure. Um, third, uh, if there are disorders of um, anorectal coordination, um, that one's pretty complicated as you go through it. I won't go through all the nitty gritty details of these. And then finally, um, you have the disorders of rectal sensation. This includes hyposensitivity, borderline hyposensitivity, and hypersensitivity. So this has everything to do with the amount of air that's injected into the balloon during rectal sensory testing. So uh, that's how we get those uh, measurements. Um, so they also wanted to make sure that um, when we are talking about these, you know, we're making sure we're telling our patients certain of these findings are minor findings that won't be very impactful and others are major findings. So you can see the blue rectangles um, indicate major findings and minor findings. And then there's also inconsistent findings as well. Okay, so as nurses, how are caring for these patients impacted by these additions? Uh, basically, we just wanted the aim of these authors was to standardize care. So it's important to um, make sure you're following that stepwise progression and are very familiar with, um, you know, what order you are doing all of, of these maneuvers and you know the amount of rest time that you're giving in between, both to get a good study and to make these patients aware. Um, so uh, they should uh, make sure that they're advising their patients on the logistics um, and reasoning behind these recommendations, how it's going to impact the appointment, you know, let them know how long it's going to take. Um, but yeah, that's about it. So I just have a little brief summary here of everything we learned about today. Uh, thanks so much for your attention. I really appreciate everybody coming uh, and I hope you found the talk informative. I will hand everything back over to Christina now to go over how to get your um, continuing ed credits for attending. Awesome. Thank you, Allison, for a most informative presentation. Um, I'd like to tell everyone how to get their certificate of completion. Um, so again, this has been approved for one contact hour for nurses. To obtain your CE credits, you'll go to www.saxtesting.com forward slash INIT. Um, you will need to register at the site, complete the evaluation, and upon successful completion, you'll be able to pr print your certificate. And then the archive version or the on-demand version will be available at www.initiatives-patientsafety.org. Um, an email will be sent to everyone when it's available, and the on-demand version will be accredited um, for nurses. And then let's go ahead and get started. I think we have time for just a couple questions, um, and we had quite a few questions come through. Um, lots of questions about the balloon. Um, so could you share some tips on how to tie the balloon so it doesn't deflate during the procedure? Yeah, that's something that we had to work really hard at um, mastering. Um, so what we like to do is, um, of course, you have to be mindful of the sensors um, and not touching those uh, because the more you touch them, the more likely they are that they're going to get damaged. Um, so holding those little silver, um, there should be, you know, I'm, again, I'm not familiar with a lot of the other um, equipment out there if you're not using Medtronic uh, catheters, but what I like to do is we use dental floss to tie ours. So what I usually do is I tie it, I tie the, I tie the balloon on at two different points and they're each on those silver little mechanisms. Um, what I do is I usually wrap three times one way. And then with the one, as I'm holding the string, wrap three times and then do another wrap three times and then just tie um, in a knot and a bow. Of course, that you have to also consider getting off the catheter because you really shouldn't be using scissors to um, snip off the, um, 
snip off the string and you need to remove the balloon to clean the catheters. So um, we like to have at least some kind of like a pull method um, to uh, make sure that that is, you know, ease of use. Sometimes running the um, uh, used catheter with the balloon on it underwater will make okay. it a little easier to untie those strings. Uh, but you need to make sure that uh, you're using an approved sink to do that because obviously the catheter has fecal matter on it. We don't want to just use that in like the bathroom sink or the room. Right, or the sink. <laughs> right, right. right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. That was really helpful. Um, okay. For the sensory testing, how often do you actually fill up to 300 mLs? One of our uh, participants wants to know. Not often, um, especially if, you know, we're finding that the patient's more hypersensitive. Um, it's very rare that we fill it all the way up to 320 mLs, um, but it certainly has happened a number of times and I expect to see it happen more. Thank you. And who usually performs the pelvic floor uh, physical therapy or the biofeedback? Uh, so we've worked um, with physical therapists um, for quite some time to uh, kind of educate them on how to perform these. Um, it's a very niche, um, you know, field in physical therapy. So you know, your routine physical therapist uh, may not be super aware on it. Uh, so we uh, at NYU have worked with our PT department you know, very hard and we, you know, make sure that our patients schedule with those that are, you know, um, able to perform it. Um, but nurses can get trained in this as well. Uh, that's not how our practice runs. But we do refer the um, pelvic floor therapy and biofeedback um, to our PT department. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and do you, do you find that patients usually find that the high resolution um, to be more comfortable than the MR defecography? Um, it's all, it's all relative. It's all, you know, very intimate area. Um, I think the MR defecography, it's a little more clean up later on because there's, you know, constantly kind of that gel kind of speaking out of them if they don't fully sell it during the imaging. So I definitely sure. say the, um, any like discomfort or anything that fell in the manometry is only in the appointment. It doesn't, you know, last as they go home. Um, okay. But either way, it should never be painful. It just, you know, it just feels kind of very strange. Thank you. All right. And um, how long does the entire appointment usually last in your clinic? Just so everyone has an idea. Yeah. So um, with our clinic, with the extensive, you know, um, kind of hand holding and talking patients through. Um, we see that our appointment, the procedure itself usually lasts about 40 to 45 minutes, um, just because we want to make sure we're not rushing the patient, we're taking our time, we're not making them feel uncomfortable in any way. Um, that usually gives us, we usually slot an hour for these, so then that gives us about 15 minutes to turn the room over. Awesome, thank you. And, um, what like, someone wants to know have you ever had any MAs perform this or is it typically only nurses yeah MAs can certainly be trained to perform these procedures uh, you always have to check with your state um, licensing requirements um, for motility testing it some, can be sometimes vague because it's such a niche field where you know it's not on a lot of the standard you know um, nurses can do this MAs can do that uh, but we're certainly not, uh, it's certainly less complicated than drawing blood. Um, so if an MA can draw blood, then this is, you know, definitely a, a um, procedure that they can do. Uh, so techs are certainly able to perform this. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for answering all these questions. And I think that's time. So I'm going to pass it over to Tracy. Thank you, Christina, and thanks for everyone for attending today's session. Immediately upon the conclusion of this webinar, you will be presented with an online survey. Please keep your web browser open and we appreciate your feedback. For your CE Certificate of Completion, to obtain your CE credits, please visit www.saxtesting.com backslash INIT. You can register at the site and complete the evaluation. We'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, and this concludes our webinar for today. We wish everyone a pleasant rest of your day. Thank you.